Great, thank you. Good morning um, and welcome on behalf of the FACC Chicago. Welcome to our webinar on PPP forgiveness, Illinois reopening challenges and efficiently dealing with customs. Um, thank you to, to all of you who are joining us this morning for the webinar and thank you to, um, to our speakers for, for being together. We have a, a, long, a long history um, with, uh, with a couple of our speakers and the, and the FACC Chicago. So it's always, always a pleasure to see you here. So we have four presenters this morning who are going to address the various aspects of getting your business back up and running in, uh, in the US and specifically in Illinois. Uh, the first is Tom Torelli, partner and owner of Torelli, uh, Torelli and Associates. Antoine Guillaume, president at International Management Solutions. Michael Richter, managing director, International Attest Solutions, LLC. And Paul Anderson, principal of the Anderson Law Firm, LLC. All, all four of them will be, will be presenting. The format today is uh, no, no um, PowerPoint presentation. Imagine if you were sitting in a room and you had four panelists in front of you and they were having a conversation with the moderator. That's how we're doing it today. So given that, we're asking that all participants keep their video turned off so that we only see the speakers when they're presenting. This presentation will be recorded and the recording will be sent to everybody who is registered after the presentation and will also be available on our website probably by the end of the day today. We um, will ask that you hold all of your questions until the end of the presentation. And if you have a question, then please unmute and unmute yourself, put your video on so we can see who you are and uh, feel free to ask, ask, uh, ask the panelists and, and start to get the conversation going. We'll let you know when that's happening. So now I'm going to turn it over to Tom Torelli, who's going to get us started on US reopening legal issues. Thanks, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea. It's great to be here with everybody. Uh, Tom Torelli of Torelli & Associates. We're a small Chicago-based law firm working exclusively with small to medium-sized French and other European companies doing business in the United States. We try to help them take advanced preventive action in order to minimize their legal risk when they do business in the US. <clears throat> That's the best way and the cheapest way to use lawyers in the U.S. is uh, when you're starting to do business, not after you've run into legal trouble, because, of course, that's when the lawyers make the money. Uh, so what do we do? We work a great deal with trademarks. Is there somebody who need, is there somebody who needs to mute themselves or I think Karen needs to mute herself. Yeah, can somebody can you can can everybody who's who's uh in the audience please make sure that you're that you're muted. So one ninety nine, a dollar ninety nine or hundred ninety nine. I'm I'm sorry, there's somebody there's somebody okay. who's not muted and the, the background noise is, is uh is getting in the way of our presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Not Molly. getting rid of all the phones, but just the 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 one that we. I'm sorry. Let me let me. Stays in the. There we go. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> all right, back back on board. Uh, so we work a lot with intellectual property rights. Contracts is the area that I've devoted the most of my time to in my professional career. Distribution related questions, employment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Setting up companies. Why should we set up a company, etc. Immigration, one of our lawyers does nothing but immigration work. We have a special service we call product liability, preventive management, what can be done now in order to reduce the risk of having any product liability problems in the future. Uh, I would like to preface my comments with the normal lawyer disclaimers. This is not legal advice. Uh, each case is new, unique. Some states are considering passing laws that create a rebuttable presumption that anyone who contracts coronavirus while uh, at, and is also working has contracted that at their job, which puts the onus on the employer to establish that the individual did not contract coronavirus at, at, their, um, at their office or business, uh, which is generally viewed by us lawyers as being a way of getting access to workman's compensation insurance. But nonetheless, some states are considering passing that. Some of you have more than 25 employees. 
others have less than employees, the application of the rules differ significantly there. Some of you have employee policies, others don't. Some have written employment agreements, some don't. So each case is totally unique. Well, the focus of my presentation is on two main things, employment continuation or termination within the scope of coming back to work and then safety in the workplace. Our view is, is that it's wise to have some form of um, policy or plan relating to coming back to work. Even those of you that are, have already restarted your business activities, um, having a plan is a good idea, we think, primarily because it gets everybody on board. The idea is to prepare a plan, propose it, circulate it to everybody on the team, get input from people, it creates ownership, it can, uh, creates uh, an environment of trust, people feel satisfied, and frankly, it helps defend a claim later on in the event that somebody says, hey, I didn't get, uh, I got sick, it's all your fault, et cetera, et cetera, at least they would have had an opportunity to be heard. Um, this relates to safety in the workplace, conditions under which people should be allowed to return to work, situations where somebody comes down with symptoms uh, or one of their family comes down with symptoms. How do we address that as a company going forward? Uh, the way to address this whole uh, issue of continued employment or not of someone is, requires a logical approach. So for example, if someone is on COVID leave when you restart your business, you can't terminate them. They're protected under the Family Medical Leave Act, which provides for up to 12 weeks of job protected medical leave for individuals. After uh, the first two weeks are not paid, after two weeks, the employer is required to pay at least two thirds of their salary. With the COVID Act that became effective on April 1st, the first two weeks are required to be paid by the employer uh, at full rate uh, when someone is out on um, FMLA. And of course, FMLA was expanded to include a child being out of school, taking care of someone who has the virus, a doctor recommended self quarantine, or someone, of course, that shows some symptoms. So if someone is on leave, don't fire them. There may be exceptions, um, such as being less than 25 employees, such as um, the whole team being furloughed, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you understand those circumstances as well or better than I am. But the idea is basically when people are out on FMLA, don't take any risks, uh, keep them on board. Uh, there are a lot of situations that are coming up now that companies are being confronted by, such as someone who um, doesn't want to return to work. I think many of us have gotten used to working from our homes uh, and aren't keen on going back to work, whether there were uh, COVID or no COVID, but th that is not an option that many of us have. But those that are work have been working from home and say, look, you know, I feel uncomfortable going back to the office. I'd rather work from home in the future. Well, you know, unless you have a written employment agreement with the individual that gives them the right to work from home, uh, or there's an, uh, a written employment policy relating there too, <clears throat> you have no obligation to keep those people on board. If they don't want to come down to the office and it's a requirement of yours, uh, whether it's absolutely necessary or not, uh, in all likelihood, you have the right to, to terminate them. If somebody has a note from their doctor that says you're exposed, uh, particularly prone or susceptible to contracting coronavirus, and they send that note in to you, uh, it's important for you to analyze the note uh, and, and understand exactly what it means. Because if the individual has a disability, then in such case, you would have to provide them some reasonable form of accommodation for that disability, unless it creates an undue hardship financially or otherwise on the company. Um, so that's, you know, a disability is something that impairs, um, substantially impairs uh, a normal human function. Uh, and, and as a result, 
you would probably have known about that ahead of time. Um, but that is a very sensitive issue and one that will likely arise for many companies. Testing. Can you require testing? Well, probably yes. Uh, you can require testing. Uh, the problem is, of course, getting results of the testing takes time now. Um, it take, can take up to five days or more in order to, to get uh, the answer. We don't think it's advisable. Um, obviously, anybody that shows symptoms should not be coming to work. Anybody that shows symptoms while they're at work should be invited to leave the, uh, the premises. What happens if somebody has been out on COVID leave, has used up their 12 weeks, comes to the office or comes to work and gets sick? What do you do then? Well, they've used up their 12 weeks. Unless there's a written employment agreement, an employment policy, et cetera, you may well be within your rights to terminate that individual's employment. Um, again, this is sensitive stuff, very sensitive stuff. Uh, and, and we counsel you to speak with your lawyer on this issue before taking any action. Um, because the whole issue of people contracting coronavirus within the workplace is something that has not yet been tried uh, and that there are going to be cases that will, up, that will be upcoming. And as a result, it's, it's important to keep your thumb on the pulse, especially if you have any action plans um, relating to continued employment of certain individuals. Um, so that's employment. Now we have safety in the workplace. I think uh, you know, we're all aware, I think, uh, only became aware very recently that Illinois is now passed into phase four, which now means that uh, with all kinds of safety uh, procedures in place, uh, health clubs, bars, restaurants can open, however, with limited capacity. Um, what's our view is, is that if you've been successful in having employees work remotely, you're welcome and encouraged from our standpoint to have those individuals continue to work remotely. Uh, of course, the team spirit is great to have, but um, it's better in terms of a safety standpoint to continue to have people work remotely. Um, encourage sick people to stay at home, uh, set up temperature gauges if you can, do those remote um, uh, testing devices uh, if you can, uh, have in-person, in person, excuse me, or virtual health checks. Well, one of the areas that uh, we're confronted with having a downtown Chicago office is transportation. You know, we've always, I think all of us have always taken public transportation to get to the office and nobody wants to do that right now for fear of being exposed. And so some of our employees are driving to work, those that are going downtown to the office, and we've set up a reimbursement policy, uh, reimbursing their uh, parking, for the, because of course it costs an arm and a leg to, to park downtown, uh, establish social distancing. Consider setting up shifts. Um, if uh, um, you, know, you can have an A team and a B team, not to discriminate against the B team, but you know, have one team that comes in during some hours and then another team that comes in at other hours if that can be, uh, can be done. Set up some touchless uh, hand sanitizers uh, uh, at the office, wear face masks. I think we've all noticed that there's been a dramatic increase again in, uh, in the number of cases. Um, and the CDC warns against the prospect of there being up to 100,000 more cases on it every day uh, if we don't maintain some kind of vigilance and discipline. And I think we should all be encouraged to do that um, until we're out of the, the, the woods. Um, that concludes my presentation for the moment. I think having a, a consistent plan, a plan that everyone um, is, has at least had a chance to have a voice in, uh, is very important and appropriate, uh, it, particularly in the event that someone gets sick and accuses the company of being responsible for that. Thank you. I will now pass it along to Antoine Guillaume and Michael Richter concerning PPP reimbursement. Thank you very much, Tom. 
Okay, so uh, Antoine Guillaume, I'm the founder of International Management Solution. Uh, we are an accounting firm uh, dedicated to assist uh, European corporations who set up and develop in the United States. And I will cover the PPP forgiveness with uh, Michael Richter, who is effectively the managing partner of our uh, audit uh, firm. So uh, the, to cover PPP is great because I've been, every time we, we're about to talk about it, I mean, something new come up. So we never say the same thing. So yes, yeah, you know, the program was supposed to be terminated or we're supposed to end yesterday. And, uh, and I understand it changed. So before we go into the forgiveness and all those change, and, uh, and I let Michael talk about that, I'll just give you a quick, uh, a quick background. So the PPP was created as part of the CARE Act to help small a mid-sized corporation to maintain or rehire re employee. It was launched in April with $349 billion. Uh, those funds were siphoned up in about two weeks, and we had a second vague phase of uh, vague in, in April uh, 21st with $310 billion. And no, it's not closed. We still have some time, and there is apparently about $130 billion still available. Uh, eligibility, uh, the rule change, but the basics, uh, five employee used to be five employee in uh, the U.S. Although uh, and then it moved to five employee for the entire group within the U.S. or not. Foreign owned is okay, so all our U.S. subsidiaries of foreign group can apply, even if it's a little complicated. Must have to be in business in February 15. Have to be obviously impacted by COVID 19. One of the great thing about this loan, obviously, is no personal guarantee. Uh, just to go rapidly around the criteria, loan criteria, uh, two and a half time average monthly payroll, max 10 million, interest rate 1%. Uh, the period was from February 15 to December 31st. That's changed too, so we'll see where we are. And the use of funds, typically payroll, interest on mortgage, utility and rent, two years maturity, and obviously the main topic of the day, possibility to be forgiven. Uh, so the forgiveness, um, we'll start now with Michael. So, Michael, can you just tell us a little bit about the general, info, the general uh, criteria for the forgiveness? And uh, there was this eight-week period, which is now 24. So, I just hand it over to you to describe all this. Yeah, so, so basically, um, there was a major change back in the uh, beginning of June. They made three major changes to the program. The original program is the period that which you measured the forgiveness was over eight weeks. Uh, the problem with that original eight week period was that many companies at that point, let's say they received their funds at the beginning of April, were still not able to reopen. You know, many states were not even told today, were not able to reopen, so they weren't able to rehire their staff. So the major change that was made was uh, the, the eight week period was extended to 24 weeks. Um, which essentially pushes it almost to the end of the year. So basically you have 24 weeks to accumulate enough payroll and other expenses to qualify for forgiveness. The other thing they changed is the original rule had a provision that 75% of the eligible expenses had to be payroll related. The other 25% could be non-payroll rent, utilities, and so forth. They have decreased that percentage to now 60% is payroll related and 40% may be the other expenses. So again, those two changes, uh, what a lot of companies were finding where it, while it was very easy to get the funds, it was more difficult to qualify to get all the funds forgiven. So those two major changes allowed more companies to qualify. Uh, in addition, they changed for the piece of the loan that might not be forgiven. Um, it's the period of repayment is extended from two years to five years. Uh, but I'll, I'll explain some more about that if, if you got your loan before that date. So, so those are the main, main changes that took place. But uh, what happened, I mean, if we got the loan early, I mean, early in the process and we want the eight weeks, I mean, do we get swapped to the 24 weeks automatically or what happened? There? Yeah, yes, we're getting a lot of questions about this. So basically, anybody who had a loan previously under the eight week program automatically moves to 24. You don't have to make an election or apply for it. However, you can make an election 
to use the eight week period. So some people for a variety of reasons may have either maximized their loan forgiveness using the shorter period, they wanna get the loan forgiven sooner, or there may be some reasons where you actually might benefit from the shorter period. Okay, so, so is, a, is a 24 weeks period monetary? Can I use the former eight week period? I mean, I bet, I, I bet yeah, I, I suspect I can, yes. Right. Yeah. You, so the 24 week is now the standard. You can elect the option to yeah. use eight weeks. Um, there's one particular type of situation where it may be actually beneficial to use the shorter period. Uh, we do have some companies who, due to economic situations, find out that although they may have brought back a lot of their staff or retained a lot of their staff, during the first part of this, they're finding maybe their business isn't coming back as quickly and they find they have to lay off employees uh, going forward. So in the PPP forgiveness, there is a, essentially a penalty if your average number of employees is less than it was at the beginning of the year. So for instance, I'll give a simple example. Let's say you had 20 people before this started, you laid off five. Uh, and you run with 15 people. If you don't do anything, the amount of loan forgiveness is automatically gonna get reduced by 25%. Uh, now, let's say some company kept the original 20, but now realizing they may have to lay some people off later in the year. If you think this might happen, uh, you may benefit by actually taking the shorter eight week period while you still have full employment, rather than risking being penalized for later laying off employees and having your loan forgiveness reduced. So there are some, some situations where the shorter period, which is optional, might be beneficial. Okay, I mean, is it the same mechanism for the change from two to five years in the repayment period, is that automatic or is it an option? No. That's actually a little bit different. Uh, there's a common misconception about where these funds come from. So the loan itself does not come from the SBA. It comes from a bank that's affiliated with the SBA. So the actual loan agreement is with your bank. Uh, same thing with the interest. So the, if, you, um, if you have a new PPP loan that started after June 5th, the term will automatically be five-year repayment. Um, so you, it is up to your lender, if you got the loan earlier, whether they want to extend the loan to five years. So it's basically up to your lender if they want to amend your loan agreement to give you the longer five-year period. So contact your lender regarding that. It's not up to the SBA. Okay, how does the process work for the forgiveness? Well, it's obviously it's with the bank, right? Yeah, again, this is another common kind of misconception because uh, people think you contact the SBA. Uh, the whole forgiveness process, again, is controlled by your bank. So you, the, the, the lender, is dealing with the bank. The bank is then dealing with the SBA. So the bank has to satisfy the SBA requirements, but each bank might have different loan forgiveness application forms. A lot of them are working with larger companies. To, the larger banks are using online platforms. Unfortunately, because of the ch major changes to the uh, PPP program in June, a lot of banks aren't ready to receive forgiveness applications, even though you might have exceeded that initial eight weeks. So again, this whole process is really controlled and, and determined by your bank as far as what documents they need, what the form looks like, whether it's online or on paper and so forth. But actually, I mean, with this 60% uh, limit, 60% uh, wages expense, uh, for, for the forgiveness, I mean, as you expect, we can pretty much, and a company can pretty much ask for the forgiveness as soon as uh, this 60% is reached, right? Uh, yeah, this was another, another comment that they clarified later. So a company saying, okay, let's say I didn't meet the maximum forgiveness after eight weeks, but after 10 or 12 weeks, I hit the maximum possible number. Do I have to wait to the end of the 24 weeks to apply for the loan forgiveness? And they've clarified that you don't. There is a catch, however. Um, there is a safe harbor provision in the PPP loan that, uh, let's say you laid off staff uh, early during the process. Under the original agreement, you had up till June 30th, there's a safe harbor that if you hired back all your people or got back to the original employment numbers by June 30th, you would not have a penalty. Under the new agreement, it now pushes out to December 31st. If you decide to apply for forgiveness early and not wait the full 24 weeks, you give up this safe harbor. So for example, um, if you didn't yet hire back your employees, you may be under this penalty situation. So there is a potential benefit to 
to applying early if you're looking for the safe harbor provision to get all your people back and not have your uh, forgiveness reduced. Okay. So, I, when you, I mean, I guess we don't have much experience there yet, but uh, how long is the forgiveness process uh, going to okay. take? Well, again, there's not a lot of, for, I, I'm not aware of a lot that I've actually been processed yet, but basically according to the terms of the agreement, the, the bank has 60 days from the time you apply for forgiveness to approve the forgiveness, but then the SBA has an additional 90 days uh, to approve that forgiveness. They've already mentioned that um, they're going to specifically target and apply more procedures to loan balances in excess of 2 million. So we suspect uh, companies with very large loan balances will take longer, uh, but many will take shorter. But again, we don't have a lot of history to see what the average amount of time uh, this forgiveness process is taking. Uh, any uh, any comments or ideas on what's circulating in this new legislation? I mean, talking about uh, forgiving every uh, every loan under fifty thousand dollars. I mean, any anything you want to add there? Um, there is some in the. The only thing that's really changed recently is, like I said, the program was supposed to expire at midnight. Actually, the program did expire at midnight last night, but uh, about four hours before that, uh, the Senate uh, approved a bill that will extend the program by another five weeks to, I believe, August 9th. Uh, the issue is, is there's unused funds. So uh, they didn't actually get, they didn't actually run out of money. So um, it still is not law as of today. So it, it, it has to go to the house and then be signed into a bill, but most likely it'll be passed, uh, which will, so if you still haven't gotten your PPP loan, there might be still time assuming this thing passes. Um, there were some other, uh, there's also some other things pending that have kind of been shelved. Uh, one of the issues is under the current, regarding the taxability of the forgiveness. Now, under the current law, the forgiveness itself is not taxable, but the IRS has ruled that any expenses claimed to get forgiveness are not deductible, which essentially means the forgiveness is taxable. There are a couple of bills floating around in committee right now because they said that the original intent of the writers of the PPP plan would be that it would be fully non-taxable. So again, that may come out later. Again, this would only affect your 2020 uh, taxes. So again, there's more time for them to figure this out. But there could be some other things coming up, other tweaks to the forgiveness uh, coming up in, in a little bit. All right, so plenty of new things to come. And so giving us the opportunity to talk about PPP forgiveness more. Uh, just one final question. What is the first, what is the, uh, what is the first day of repayment of that loan if people don't get forgiven? I mean, because it was talk about two years uh, or a year. Yeah, it, it got deferred now to one year. Okay, so that's one year from time of receipt of the funds? Correct. Okay, so anyway, things are changing. Forgiveness needs to be confirmed and uh, we need some more details. But in, in any case, there is no repayment to be made for quite a while. Yeah. I mean, regarding the loan issue, unless you didn't rehire employees, I mean, the goal with this 24-week period was to get more people fully forgiven. So theoretically, less people should end up with significant loan balances at the end, um, assu assuming they qualify for the funds. So, because you have more weeks basically to to accumulate those payroll costs and other costs. Okay. Uh, yeah, and here it's being calculated on a month on, on two and a half months of uh, of payroll with six months to six months. Uh, you know, I mean, it's not as difficult as it used to be to get up to. 60% of payroll expense. Correct. Okay. Uh, one other thing, they, they did announce that they are going to, there was some pushback by the Trump administration, they are going to actually publish uh, the names and recipients of any PPP funds in excess of 150,000. Oh, all right, Tom. Yeah, you got, you got to hide, okay. <laughs> all right, so this conclude uh, this forgiveness and uh, I'm passing it on to Paul. I mean, obviously in the custom area, a lot of things have, have happened in, in the past month and there's still those China issue and others. And it's a really important uh, aspect of all of our clients setting up and doing business in the US. So uh, Paul, uh, it's yours. Thank you, Antoine. Uh, good morning to everyone. Um, uh, my name is Paul Anderson. I'm with the Anderson Law Firm and we specialize only in customs and related trade matters. 
Uh, in fact, uh, the vast majority of our client base uh, imports products into the US and to a lesser extent to Canada. So that uh, kind of gives you the backdrop of what we do. Uh, at first blush, COVID-19 and customs don't have too much in common, but nonetheless, um, as Antoine mentioned, uh, it's important to have knowledge of what's going on. And if you want to be efficient and you're dealing with customs, it's, uh, you have to keep up with things and they're changing very rapidly. I've been practicing law for many years in this area and I can say without a doubt, the last two years have been the most rigorously changing environment I've ever seen. It's almost impossible to keep up even for people that uh, are used to doing it. So um, that has made it a little more difficult for customs. I can't say that I'm a big, uh, that I have a lot of sympathy for customs ordinarily, but uh, the last two years I do because it's, it's so hard to process so many things. But um, there are a couple of interesting things uh, with respect to COVID-19, some of the only overlap I can see. And that is I had a huge uh, volume of calls about importing masks as soon as uh, this situation arose. And the FDA uh, allegedly was more lenient I think that's probably true, but I also got two or three calls from uh, small people that thought this was an opportunity to uh, jack up the price, and uh, they got a knock on their door from the FBI. So that, in terms of direct COVID-19 environment, that's the, that's the one issue. Uh, communication with customs, it's never been overly uh, easy, but uh, today with the COVID-19, a lot of customs people are at home, uh, tel uh, telephone communication, I would say, is pretty spotty. Uh, you need to leave several voicemails for them to call you back. Emails, of course, are better. It's important to continue, even in this kind of a crazy environment, to recognize your obligations as an importer under the statute, which is to exercise reasonable care in everything that you do. So um, you need to document everything. You need to be responsive to customs and you need to, you need to go ahead and, and uh, do things that you were ordinarily doing, say, in contesting their decisions, trying to get refunds. There's nothing wrong with that. But you have to uh, be extra careful about it. You have to be extra patient about it because they don't operate as quickly as they used to. One uh, giant caveat, uh, because customs seems uh, hopelessly muddled at times, uh, you may be inclined to think, well, they're not really paying attention to my file. That may be true in the short term, but I can assure you they've been well-funded for enforcement in the next few years, and um, I just encourage you to, uh, to take extra care there. So how do you be efficient? Uh, how can you be efficient with customs? Well, the key element is knowledge, and I, I just want to go over some of the uh, cases in the limelight here and explain a little bit of what they are and then address those questions that were on the invitation. And uh, after that, I'll turn it back over and I can handle any questions that you have. Uh, so in the news today, uh, obviously I'm sure everyone has uh, seen about uh, the uh, press on new NAFTA, which is the USMCA, US-Mexico-Canada agreement. That actually becomes effective today. And uh, uh, it seems like it's been in the press for an awful long time, but uh, the regulations came out last night, interim regulations. Uh, they'll be commenting on that until next May or June, I think. Uh, it's designed to be uh, generally more efficient. There's a lot of emphasis on transparency, elect uh, digital uh, services, things of that nature. The two areas that are most concerned, uh, that have the most changes are textiles and uh, those related to automotive. Um, there are reduced uh, certification requirements and things of that nature. We're all uh, learning our way along. The good news there is the agreement itself says that enforcement is to be, uh, the emphasis should be on uh, knowledge imparted by customs and not enforcement for the six months until people get their uh, bearings and, and see where they're going. Uh, probably the most uh, high, uh, high profile case is the China 301 case. So I just want to take a minute. You see this, the term section 301 thrown around and that's, a, uh, that's the device that's used for China and also um, 
on Airbus uh, from uh, European Union. There's also another case uh, referred to as Section 232. So when you see that, now you'll know uh, how to respond. Uh, China 301, or uh, 301 generally, is um, it's a statute that allows the government, U.S. government, to retaliate on a country uh, for unfair trade practices. Now, in the case of China, there was an investigation. The uh, people, uh, ultimately, what, what the problem was, was intellectual property theft and uh, currency manipulation, a couple of other things. But at, at any rate, there was a determination that there were unfair trade practices. And it allows the government to retaliate on product sectors. Well, in this case, the entire tariff schedule is named. And uh, most of the duties are 25%. So that is a, a very serious thing. And it's, there's no deadline on this. It could go on for quite some time. The other uh, section is section 232. And that section uh, is based on national security. And um, what happens there is if there's uh, imports uh, uh, that are not covered by dumping cases or other cases, imports that threaten national security, the, namely the domestic industries that contribute to national security, uh, then uh, retaliation is possible on those as well. And that's what happened with the steel and aluminum cases from Europe. Uh, steel had 25% duties and aluminum had 10% duties. Uh, so there is another, there's a, another 232 national security investigation in the works right now as we speak on vanadium and derivative products from vanadium. They are having uh, comments on that. Um, and then also there's the opportunity with respect to Airbus retaliation, and that's the uh, what uh, mostly food products so far, wine, cheese, things of that nature. Uh, they revisit that every six months and they can determine whether they should adjust the duty rates. A lot of the duty rates are 10 and 25%, but they're allowed to go up to 100%. So that's, uh, that comment period will be ending in July. So to get to the uh, questions real quickly uh, that I had uh, posed, uh, a very common question is, uh, I have components that are made in China and uh, send them to France for further processing or manufacture. Uh, am I covered by the Section 301 case from China? Well, to be covered by that, you have to be a product of China, and that means there's an origin determination that it's a, uh, of, of Chinese origin. So the rule that applies in determining origin in this kind of a thing is the, what we would call the common law substantial transformation test. Some, some agreements have bright line you know, 35% local content you're in. Some have tariff shifts uh, such as NAFTA. None of that applies on the 301 case. What happened, the test is you look at the finished product, say it's uh, made in France, and then you work backwards and every component that goes into that product that's not from France uh, has to be substantially transformed and that mean in France uh, for it to lose its Chinese origin. Now that means a, su a substantial transformation means a, uh, a, a change in the product so that it becomes, has a different character, nature, and usage. And it's, uh, it basically becomes a new and different article of commerce. So those, ca uh, those questions are uh, very much on a case-by-case -case basis and they can, they're a little bit over the board, but that's fundamentally how it works. Obviously, if you send two components to France and screw them together, that's a simple assembly. That's not going to work. And if everything is made in France, well, of course, there's no issue. It's that gray area in between. Uh, with respect to the China 301 duties, uh, and a very elaborate exclusion process was put into place. Uh, the opportunity to request exclusions from that has uh, passed. But uh, those exclusions uh, are in place until they expire, and, and many are still in place, and many go retroactive to September of 2018. If your product is specifically described in a particular exclusion and you can meet all the specifications, you can apply for an exclusion even if your company did not request it. As long as you uh, meet it, you can go through the procedures to get refunds. This contrasts with the, uh, the steel and aluminum case, which also allowed exclusions. But in that case, you had to request the exclusion yourself and only that company could take advantage of it. 
Uh, last, uh, there are retaliatory duties uh, on the uh, being discussed again uh, with Airbus. Digital services tax, now that involved France uh, six months ago. That's kind of on the back burner pending some settlement discussions. And then of course this vanadium case that I mentioned. So those are the, uh, the, the basics. Uh, the key to dealing with customs is to be responsive, know what you're doing, and uh, be honest. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you all very much. A lot to, uh, a lot to, take, to take into account here, and I think this is all really, really helpful information. So thank you all for giving your different perspectives. Um, we'd like to open it up to questions right now. We have about 15 minutes. If you have a question, please unmute yourself and turn on your video so we can see who you are and you have a chance to introduce yourself to our speakers. So the, the floor is open. Please feel free to, to go ahead. And if you have a question that you'd rather communicate by chat, feel free to do that and I can ask it for you. Anyone? I'm happy to be available to have offline chats with people. Okay. Uh, if you're uh, able to send out our information. We will. We will in the follow-up email, we'll make sure that we send everybody's contact information. Actually, Tom, I have a question that, that, that I thought of as you were, you were doing your part of the presentation and you mentioned, um, you mentioned testing, uh, uh, forced testing. I was wondering, but the, what is, the, is, there, is there a similar question that you'd have to ask about asking people to get vaccinated once the vaccine is available? And are there issues, legal issues around that, that, that people should be thinking of? Well, that's a, that's a great question. I, uh, and I don't have the answer to that. I'm not sure that anybody does at this stage. I do know that, um, uh, that, the, that the EEOC has made a pronouncement that uh, companies cannot require uh, COVID antibody testing. Um, but the actual testing of, uh, of the coronavirus, an employer can require the testing before people are allowed back um, into the office, but I can't answer your question, at least not yet. Other questions from, from the audience? Um, in which case, I, have, I actually have another one. I don't wanna uh, keep pounding you, but it, and maybe this is a little bit of a question for everybody. This is, this, this COVID-19 situation is, is a bit extraordinary in the, in the, the literal sense of the, of the term and, and very unexpected. And I think that businesses are kind of spinning now trying to figure out how to react and, and how to plan for the long term. So what are some of the long term um, measures that businesses should be taking, assuming that, that this could happen again? I mean, that this is probably not something that's, that's just going to happen to us once. Unfortunately, hopefully the, the impact won't be as drastic as, as as it is now because we'll, we'll be better better prepared but what what do businesses need to be thinking about in their long-term planning i'll uh, i'll start this and then i'll let the other speakers chime in i think uh, real estate is a real important issue to address um i think uh, everyone has now become somewhat more comfortable than they were before uh, working remotely and uh you know uh, no offense to big expensive offices downtown, but I think um, that's a real issue to address as to uh, the viability of having a downtown office. Um, as you say, Andrea, we don't know how long this is going to last, whether there are going to be new waves, mutations, et cetera, et cetera, what happens when winter comes and all that, uh, and whether clients, contacts, uh, customers are interested in coming to your office uh, it, it to, to meet with you. Uh, so the, that's a real, real question. The size of, of office space and the whole issue of working remotely is, is, is front and center, certainly for us. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I obviously totally agree with Tom. I mean, that, that's going to be the key. I mean, we're not going to have as many in-person relationships as, uh, as we uh, and meeting as, as we used to to have. So we, we besides uh, the remote, uh, the remote office, we need to start in communicating differently, and uh, uh, that's going to be also very differently, very very different. Uh, so that's probably going to be the major, the major ones. Um, I'll just chime in on the customs end. 
the clear, uh, this is not, it's indirectly COVID-19. So uh, the, the biggest long-term trend that I've seen is the number of companies that want to move their sources of manufacturing um, fr frequently out of China, but uh, just uh, to have a multi-level uh, country uh, option to, uh, to source material. Uh, one of the interesting things was there's a big move from uh, China to Vietnam and people spent a lot of money to do that. COVID-19 came along, the engineers could not get out of China. <laughs> that resulted in about a 90 to 120 day delay. So uh, COVID-19 is, uh, is everywhere and affects everything. Do we have any other, any other questions from the, from the audience? We, we do have a few more minutes, so we're, we're happy to take more questions by chat or, or live. Do you wanna unmute yourself and put your video on? If not, uh, what we will do is we will, oh, good. Hi. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, did I hear it right that uh, a foreign ownership is not a problem? So we are a subsidiary of a German company. We are 100% owned by the German company and is a PPP program applicable to us as well? And I'm, I'm, I think you said a foreign ownership is not a problem, but I'm not sure if I heard it right. Michael, I think that's for you, right? Yeah, I'll take that. Um, basically, the fact that you're foreign owned does not disqualify you from obtaining a PPP loan. The issue that affects you now is how you count your number of employees and determine eligibility. Uh, so you, you basically have to ensure that all your uh, companies and related companies worldwide have less than 500 employees in total. So okay, that's, that's, really, that's, that's a given, yeah. We are 100 yeah. people, so that's very okay. easy and straightforward. Yeah, so there should be no reason why you wouldn't qualify. Now, so, now some of the lenders were not as comfortable in dealing with foreign-owned companies as others. So it, 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 it really depends on your banking relationship and how willing – they have to do a few extra steps, uh, especially if the, the parent companies don't have tax ID numbers and stuff like that. But it is technically possible, just the question of how willing they are to help you out. Thank you so much. That sure. helped. And uh, Tomas, if you're unsuccessful in convincing your bank that first of all has to be affiliated or registered with the SBA, uh, if you have trouble with your bank, talk to Antoine, Michael, or me. Uh, there's at least one bank that we know that works a great deal with foreign companies doing business in the US. And if it's true, as Michael says, that the PPP program is being for another five weeks, they may be open to, uh, to discussing that prospect with you. So yeah, there would be a million to get rid of. I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much. Anyone else? No. Okay. We will um, thank you all for, for participating. Thank you to our speakers for being with us this morning and for sharing all this, this wealth of information with us. This is, this is really helpful and, and things are, are changing week to week. So it's, um, it's really important that we, uh, that we try to stay up to date on everything, on everything that's happening. Um, we will send a follow-up email to everybody who registered this morning with the four speakers contact information and a link to the recording. There's no presentation, so that's that's what we'll do. Um, that will allow you to get directly in touch with uh, with anybody you heard this morning. Thank you all again, and we hope to see you soon. Stay safe. Thanks. Thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.